Good morning, everybody. Delighted to be here. I've missed a couple of IWA conferences that I was supposed to speak at and had to bail at the last moment, so um, apologies for, uh, for that in the past. And apologies also to those of you who have seen aspects of this presentation before. I'm thinking particularly Cloda, who will have seen at least five or six slides uh, and others. But anyway, hopefully it's, uh, it's new and interesting and, uh, and, dare I say, it, even exciting for some of you. It certainly is, uh, has been for, for me, and we're entering a particularly exciting phase now. So I'm just going to take things back a level from uh, the level that, uh, that Ainsley was talking about. He was focusing, obviously, on development consent on that aspect of the planning, the marine planning system. I'm going to talk about forward planning um, and our development of the, uh, the, the National Marine Planning Framework. So just to start with, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, but what is marine spatial planning? Well, it's about allocating space for human activity or organizing human activity in marine spaces, balancing demands for people who want to use the sea, planning for, acti for where activities take place, ensuring that they're as effective and sustainable as possible, and activities that are included, human activities that marine planning, uh, marine plans generally deal with, it would include things like uh, climate change, aquaculture, culture and heritage, defense and security, energy, fisheries, mar marine aggregates. So these are the sorts, sorts of things that marine plans, regardless of which jurisdiction you might be talking about, they will all deal with these sorts of things uh, fairly typically. So who's involved in MSP in Ireland? Well, kind of bizarre that a department uh, with housing in its title is responsible for marine spatial planning in one sense, but I think it reflects more our terrestrial planning, our forward planning expertise that's been built up since the, 19, uh, the 1960s, uh, since the first terrestrial planning code was introduced. So it's building on that rather than, uh, rather than anything else. And I think we also have an advantage over other departments, or we can make an advantage over the fact that we have uh, we don't have a sectoral interest to represent, so we can be honest brokers, we can be more objective, I think, because we're not directly responsible for renewable energy or fisheries or aquaculture or ports, we can take a more balanced view. And I think that's important for the, for the credibility and the integrity of the final plan. So we have a small team in the department that has a mixture of administrative and technical staff. Uh, we have an external advisory group that's chaired by Minister English. We have uh, the Marine Coordination Group, which is uh, chaired by Minister Creed. Uh, there's the Marine Legislation Steering Group, which, uh, which Ainsley mentioned, which is really driving the delivery of the, the MPDM. I prefer MPDM, I think it's much better than MAFA because I think it actually more, it's, it doesn't roll off the tongue so well, but I think it more appropriately captures the new level of ambition in the legislation and the fact that it is a kind of a, a marine parallel to the Terrestrial uh, Planning and Development Acts, but that's an aside. Uh, we receive technical and, uh, and evidence support from the Marine Institute, and, uh, and we're, we're very fortunate to get, uh, to get that input from them. That has, uh, that has been uh, an integral part of the, the mapping for, uh, for both our baseline report published last year and for the plan, which will be coming out shortly. And then we are also in parallel undertaking the SEA and uh, AA, uh, and Antonia will, uh, will speak a little bit more about that. So this is just a quick... Uh, visual aid to describe how marine spatial planning is intended to work. Our main driver is the, uh, the Maritime, Maritime Spatial Planning Directive, uh, which came out in 2014, after harnessing our ocean wealth. Both harnessing our ocean wealth and, uh, and, the, uh, and the directive identified the need for, uh, for Ireland uh, to have a spatial plan in place to organize the different regulatory uh, regimes that were already active in Ireland's marine space. We transposed the directive through a set of uh, EU regulations in 2016 and then replaced that in 2018 in the Planning and Development Act uh, to provide a, a, a primary legislative basis and to also go a little bit beyond what the directive required to give the Oireachtas a role to set out what the public consultation requirements would be because that's been a very important part of our process so far. Uh, the, the thing that underpins all marine planning uh, whether it's the legislation or the plan or enforcement in future, will be the Marine Planning Policy Statement, which is a parallel to the 2015 Terrestrial Planning Policy Statement. So I know we're throwing a lot of new documents and acronyms out recently, but it's important that we have a proper system that's based on a hierarchy of plans and policy documents, because I think that's one of the things that has been lacking in marine planning uh, over the years has been a kind of a lack of clarity around what are the, what are the key legislative and policy underpinnings for the decisions that are taken, whether it's in, uh, in the department on a, on a foreshore lease or license, or in the EPA on a dumping and sea license, or in, uh, in the Department of Agriculture on a sea fisheries or aquaculture license. So it's really important for us to have that foundation in place as a, a policy statement that informs the legislation and also informs the, uh, the forward plan. The fourth box there is the, uh, the, the NMPF, so that's the part that we're working on at the moment, uh, and this is intended to provide the sector-specific uh, policies, marine planning policies, to guide decision-makers on how to deal with applications for different types of activity. 
So it's about consenting and enforcement, uh, really. It's, a, it's about informing the consenting and enforcement processes. We are working on a single national plan at the moment, but we have the possibility in future cycles to do uh, regional marine plans, and that's the intention that we will do, and we will be saying this in the, in the, the draft national plan, that we will be doing at least three uh, regional plans. And I can talk a bit more about that. So I've gone too far ahead here and, and missed my uh, handy visual aids. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can see what I was uh, saying there about transposition uh, through, the, uh, through the MPDM. We're going to take the, marine, the, the planning and development transposition and put it into MPDM, so again, Everything for marine planning will appear in that single piece of legislation, forward planning, development management, and, uh, and enforcement. The plan itself is in development. It's in the final stages of development at the moment. We intend to go to government quite shortly with a view to publish in early October for a three-month consultation. Uh, and we will also publish in parallel the final marine planning policy statement, which went out to consultation in, uh, in June. Just to give you an idea of the, of the proposed structure, anyone who's familiar with our uh, NMPF baseline report from last year will know broadly the structure that we used in that case, which was around setting out the kind of the, the context for marine spatial planning, the, both the national and the international context, the legislative context, the policy and the regulatory context. The thing that will be different, I think, in the, uh, in the draft plan in terms of that introductory context part will be a much heavier emphasis on the marine uh, planning policy statement rather, th rather than on harnessing our ocean wealth. Harnessing our ocean wealth was a, a kind of a broad marine policy document for, uh, for all sectors. It wasn't a policy, uh, a policy framework, so we have, uh, sorry, a planning policy framework, so that's what the MPPS does. So in our vision, objectives, and uh, approach to policies, we will be basing it on the, uh, the MPPS, the vision, the goals, the principles, and the priorities in, in there, and uh, also the high-level objectives that we set for the NMPF back in the baseline report. After that sort of general introduction, which is kind of broadly similar, summarized there, I won't go into them uh, in, in much detail. Um, maybe just to pick out a couple of things though, that we will have, uh, we'll have references in there to say international boundary issues, the potential uh, implications of Brexit in terms of our interactions with, uh, with our, our, our neighbors in, um, in Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, and, and Wales, uh, and also the Isle of Man, which is a, which is a single um, marine planning jurisdiction also. We'll talk about, the, uh, about climate change aspects and how the, the plan is intended to be part of the implementation of the Climate Action Plan. After that general introductory piece, we will get into uh, overarching marine planning policies. So these are marine planning policies that will be applicable to proposals, all proposals in the maritime area. So these will be things like climate change and how climate change needs to be factored into the decision-making process or what climate change policies need to be factored into the process. Things like biodiversity, noise, uh, coexistence, infrastructure. So they will be the general, the overarching marine planning policies will be based around the kind of the, the three broad pillars of, of forward planning. Uh, so that's environment, economic, and social. They will all be contextualized, explained, and justified separately. Uh, we will represent the characteristics against which the impacts of proposals need to be considered. Uh, they'll be numbered and presented separately and cross-referenced against the relevant sectoral policies. And then they'll all be supplemented by the, the sector-specific policies in the, the individual uh, chapters. These are some of the kind of the broad issues that will be covered by the general marine planning policies. It looks as though there are many more environmental general marine planning policies than there are, for example, economic. But that's not the case once you get into the, the, the sector-specific, where you'll see that there are a lot more that are maybe on the, uh, on the economic and, and social sides. So just to take an example, coexistence, this is our general marine planning policy on coexistence. So we're saying in the plan that proposals should demonstrate that they have considered how to optimize the use of space, including through consideration of opportunities for coexistence and cooperation with existing activities, providing benefits to existing activities where possible. If they can't avoid significant adverse impacts, et cetera, you can, you can read the rest. So the purpose of this is to ensure that when an application comes in, uh, whether it's to the board or to a department that's responsible for a, a different sectoral activity, that the applicant can show that they have at least considered the potential opportunities for coexistence, uh, and where there aren't opportunities, that they have considered what the potential adverse impacts on an existing activity are. That's not to say that it will automatically rule out a new activity, or that it will be absolutely guaranteed to get consent, but it puts an onus on a, on a prospective developer, or somebody who wants to carry forward an activity, to show that they have at least considered uh, what the implications are for existing activities and uh, existing users. So the general marine planning policies all need to be read in combination with a sector specific. So 
Uh, these will provide a much more detailed basis for decision making in relation to specific activity types, including renewable energy, offshore renewable energy. So these will specify the types of activity to be supported, the interactions that a particular activity might have with other sectors. So for example, interactions between ORE and ports or ORE and fisheries. Uh, the sensitivity of the receiving environment and what the approach needs to be in terms of mitigating or avoiding impacts. And in some cases, as, as Ainsley has said, uh, these will be supplemented in future by uh, designations or, or zones uh, kind of broadly modelled on the strategic de development zone approach. So that will allow for ministers responsible for, for example, offshore renewable energy to bring forward proposals for the designation of a certain area of sea for renewable energy, and then that must be subject to public consultation and SEA and AA before it can finally be adopted at a whole-of-government level in the same way that SDZs are a, are a, a whole-of-government decision. So uh, these will apply to uh, the, the policies, the sector-specific and the general marine planning policies will be a legal obligation on all public bodies that have a decision-making role. So they will all be required, not just, you're probably familiar with terrestrial planning language where planning authorities have to have regard to certain things, that's the, that's the kind of the legal text. Well, in our transposing legislation, public bodies are legally obliged to secure the objectives of the National Marine Planning Framework. So, Public authorities have no choice other than to implement the policies that are in the, uh, in, the, in the plan. It's not a question of discretion to have regard to, they must secure the objectives. And there's a policing responsibility on the minister then to ensure the public, public bodies are actually doing that. And the minister can then direct a public body uh, to, to take steps to secure the objectives of the plan if there is dissatisfaction with how they're going about implementing the plan. Just to take an example. Um, this is a, an early draft from uh, Ports, Harbors and Shipping. Um, so proposals that may have a significant impact upon current activity and future opportunity for expansion of port and harbor activities should demonstrate that they will, in order of preference, avoid, minimize or mitigate, if not possible, to mitigate uh, proposals should state the case for proceeding. So this is kind of typical of what I would call supportive marine planning policies that are generally in place in the draft plan for all activities. So the approach is generally, we will start with a supporting activity to say, proposals for this type of activity should be supported, subject to the normal environmental assessments. And then we follow those up with a second policy. There may be more, but generally the first one is a supportive policy. The second one will then be a, a protective policy. So uh, to protect ports from new development, existing port activity from new development that may adver adversely impact, and the same broadly will apply to ORE. So supportive framework uh, at first, and then the second will be to protect existing ORE development from new activities, whether it's for aquaculture or ports development or, uh, or a new offshore renewable energy uh, development. Again, each policy will be supported by uh, supporting material. This will include the, the local, national, European uh, context, the policy context cross-reference them, them to other sector-specific policies and the general policies. Maps, which won't be zones, but will uh, include whatever spatial information we have, so the identification of the areas where uh, certain activities already take place. Interpretation notes where, where, uh, where required, but it's written in, in pretty plain, plain English. Um, signposts to the, the kind of the important background documents that we've used in, in coming to these policies. So for example, in terms of ports, national ports policies, port, port master plans. In terms of renewable energy, obviously uh, energy white paper or EDP, uh, climate action plan. Suggestions of who the policy might be of particular interest to and then the identif identification of stakeholders who need to be consulted in the implementation of a particular policy. So without, again, without going into too much detail on the policies themselves, uh, the, the policies support implementation of all of these things. So to, to pick out the things that are of uh, most interest to, to you guys, uh, the action plan to, clim to tackle climate disruption or EDP, energy white paper, but there are lots of other things as well because we are trying to balance uh, multiple uh, government policy uh, priorities and, uh, and different areas of, of activity. Uh, it's also being used as the kind of the, uh, as an implementation uh, measure for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and that's where a lot of the general um, environment uh, policies have, uh, have, have fed through. So just to move on to the final slide and next steps, the draft plan is going to government in early, early October. Um, there are obviously key linkages with uh, which Ainsley mentioned uh, to the, the MPDM and the Marine plan Planning Policy Statement. We will be publishing the SEA and AA in parallel uh, with a three-month consultation on, on all of those documents and we will be having regional events in the autumn which will be slightly different to the, the events that we had on our baseline report. They'll be more practical getting into the detail in some of the policies. So. Uh, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.